As I've grown from high school and into college, I've come to realize just how much I admire Square Enix's rich library of games. In the year of recovery from a worldwide pandemic, I've taken pleasure in both replaying and finishing key entries in the Final Fantasy series. I revisited Final Fantasy VII Remake with the new intermission content, which has got me even further pumped for the series' future. I replayed Final Fantasy IX, a beloved entry which I played previously on fair terms, up until the final boss because it was a nasty thorn in my side. This time, though, I actually took the guy out with no toggle functions and felt really happy about it. I finished six for the first time, which I had nearly finished prior before the layout of the final dungeon intimidated me. I had similar experiences with 10-2. No, not 10-2. 10-2. Like, also 10. Even though that road to near 100% is a grueling endeavor, I made Yuna the best mage in the series, got all of the Aeons, told Seymour to eat it, and ended Spira's curse with little to no hassle. And you know what? I also beat Final Fantasy VIII, and I liked it despite its hiccups. So after having six or so Final Fantasies under my belt, forgot to mention 15, which I also like, I had been indulging myself with Final Fantasy XIV, up until Endwalker came out and had barred me, a free trial player, from getting out of the interlude patches and into Heavensward, with the only thing stopping me from upgrading are the harsh realities of being a broke college student. If it's not apparent, I love Final Fantasy. And it plunged me into Square Enix's rich, expensive web of beloved IPs. Nier Automata became one of my favorite action games of all time, and the gripping and addictive nature of Dragon Quest XI has got me wanting to try more of the series in due time. However, there is one series in particular that I have to thank for catapulting me into all of these endeavors. And it's not even owned by Square Enix. No! No, 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 no! Don't play that one! I've already gotten a few copyright claims from select tracks. Even the suddenly cover from my Super Metroid Inquire, so I don't need another one. Kingdom Hearts. What is it? Good question. But we'd be here all day if I told you what it was. But... I can provide a background on the series. Following the success of Super Mario 64, Square Enix higher-ups Shinji Hashimoto and Hironobu Sakaguchi wanted to give their spin on a 3D title with free movement, but were hesitant knowing there was only one character who could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mario. That character, of course, being... Mickey Mouse, which included a catalog of properties acquired through nearly a century of conquest from the ashes of a global economic depression. In eavesdropping Tetsuya Nomura, best known for his character and art designs in the Final Fantasy series, asked if he could help out with the project, under the condition he would be the director. Hashimoto would agree to his terms, but the project itself still needed to be realized. Luckily, the concept was able to come to fruition thanks to Hashimoto, get this, having a chance encounter with a Disney executive in an elevator, as both Squaresoft and Disney of Japan shared an office building at the time. After a two-year development cycle, Kingdom Hearts was released for the PlayStation 2 in March of 2002, which was brought with loving praise from critics alike. From then on, Kingdom Hearts became a series still cherished by its fans to this day. Ridiculous narrative and all. But that point of contention can wait for right now. One day, this game captivated my eye at my cousin's house when going through their games. The sequel, at least. I couldn't help but be intrigued by that cover with three characters I wasn't familiar with next to Mickey, Donald, and Goofy dressed in somewhat medieval attire. Just as I was about to try it, I noticed that it was rated E10, and 7-8 to eight year old me had just previously been revoked of the privilege to play Shadow the Hedgehog a little while back on account of... well... Damn. Damn it. Damn you. Where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? So because of that, I was hesitant to give it a try. Growing up, though, I had a lot of affinity for select Disney films such as Beauty and the Beast and Mulan. I played games like Toontown and Epic Mickey, and I was one at a young age who tuned into Disney Channel nearly every day for Zack and Cody, Kim Possible, Hannah Montana, a movie like High School Musical, and the first season or two of Phineas and Ferb. And do not, do not get me started on Club Penguin. This... This was our Final Fantasy XIV back then. People who've been following the Scions of the Seventh Dawn on a grand quest through Hydaelyn may not have had the privilege of meeting Captain Rockhopper, playing card jitsu, reciting plays, or even spending hours trying to tip the iconic iceberg. After dedicating myself to Cartoon Network's renaissance in the early 2010s, though, I sort of fell off my Disney hype aside from the annual Pixar film. But following a watch to many YouTube videos about the series in lore, which, yes, did hurt my head at first, my interest peaked back up and I started my venture with the series in 2014 with Kingdom Hearts 2. Yes, it was a little disorienting not starting with the first game, but the more I played, the more everything just... 
beautifully came together. But I'm not here to talk about how remarkable of a sequel it is. Not yet, anyways. I'm first tackling a game that had me mixed at first jumping from KH2, but eventually warmed up to the more I played it. This is the humble beginnings of a series that not only reignited my admiration of Disney's legacy, but also took me into greater heights into a genre of gaming I fell in love with. Strap in, you lot. This is gonna be a long one. Good day to you all, I'm the Squire, and welcome to another one of my inquires. Let's take a look at Kingdom Hearts. And when I said strap yourselves in, I, I mean strap yourselves in. Because for the first time in my series, I intend to cover the entire story of a game. And I couldn't have chosen any better. If you're familiar with Kingdom Hearts in any capacity, then you might be aware that the overarching story is a behemoth of scattered plot threads that frequently utilizes the playbook of silly anime tropes. While this may be a turnoff for many, me and many others find charm out of seeing how the main ensemble of characters react, deal, and grow with the ever-expanding lore of the series. That being said, Kingdom Hearts 1 has the benefit of being... the first in the series. So the story is a little easier to keep up with, all things considered. When the series moves forward, you just have to remember a whole lot more. So let's tackle these plot points one at a time. Our story begins with a teenage boy named Sora, who's been having dreams fighting shadowy creatures on stained glass frames of iconic Disney princesses while following the wisdom from a voice filled with existential philosophy. Yeah, that sounds like a dream, all right. When Sora comes to, he wakes up from a nap on the shores of Destiny Islands, a tropical setting with one island serving as his hometown, seen only in cutscenes, and the other being where he spends quality time with his best friends, Riku and Kairi. Riku has been both Sora's childhood friend and mutual rival, whereas Kairi came to the islands later on and is someone who Sora shares a close bond with. Of course, being his best friend, Riku gets an occasional laugh teasing Sora about his feelings for Kairi. We come to learn these three have a desire to set sail and visit other worlds, with Riku being especially adamant on wanting to leave following Kairi's mysterious appearance. As we get acquainted with game through tutorials and fighting our first batch of Final Fantasy cameos, work on the trio's raft has been going well, that is, until... It needs a name. Perfect. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Sackman here. While Sora's gathering supplies, this man gives him a foreboding warning about the world being connected, and believe it or not, he will be a pretty crucial plot point moving forward in the series. Meanwhile at Disney Castle, are you feeling that whiplash yet? Donald Duck and Goofy come to learn that their king, Mickey Mouse himself, has gone missing. They eventually find a letter in his office noting that he's concerned over the state of increasing darkness across the worlds and tasks the two to go find the key to help fend off the darkness. With Jiminy Cricket and Pluto by their side, the two head off in their rocket, the gummy ship, and head for a new world to find what they're looking for. Back on Destiny Islands, a dangerous storm arrives which provokes Sora to skip dinner with his mom and to go check on the raft. When Sora arrives to the other island, he is immediately swarmed by the shadowy creatures from his dreams. These here are known as the Heartless. Skipping ahead a little, these creatures here are the physical amalgamations of darkness within people's hearts. When people's hearts are consumed by the darkness around them, Heartless are formed and seek hearts to create even more Heartless to spread darkness within the realm of light. Sora eventually catches up to Riku, but he's in the midst of becoming one with the darkness that is dragging him away. Before Sora is dragged along with Riku, a beacon of light finds itself into Sora's hands, the Keyblade. The Keyblade is a weapon that is capable of damaging the Heartless, so Sora is able to fight his way through the invaders and into his secret hideout to find Kairi. Before the two are able to embrace, the cave's door opens and a gust of wind pushes Kairi through and past Sora. Following one more encounter with the same Heartless from his dreams, Sora is swept away from his home, and the islands are lost to darkness. Upon waking, Sora finds himself in Traverse Town, a special world that appears when one loses their home and is in need of shelter, including the likes of Sid, Yuffie, and Aerith from Final Fantasy VII, and Squall from Final Fantasy VIII. An important thing to note is that while these characters are indeed the ones from their respected games in terms of both name and face, they're different people with different experiences. Essentially, the series' take on the character. Where Squall was a moody 17-year-old in his own game, for instance, this incarnation is in his mid-twenties and is a little more level-headed, though we can't hear his thoughts to know if that's for certain. And of course, while Aerith knows one of our favorite protagonists in Cloud, you won't hear anything related to Mako, Midgar, or the Promised Land from Final Fantasy VII. But after taking a thrashing from Squall, the man sits Sora down and drops some exposition on the Keyblade, and its ability to seal a world's keyhole to protect it from falling to darkness. 
Additionally, Aerith fills in Donald and Goofy on a man named Ansem. Ansem was known as the ruler of the world Squall and his party were originally from, and was a dedicated scientist. Throughout the game, you will come across research reports from Ansem himself, and the different research he conducted which ranges from Heartless, Darkness in People's Hearts, The Heart of Worlds, and so on. In fact, a special kind of Heartless, known as Emblem Heartless, are a byproduct of this research, and they release a heart upon defeat compared to their pure-blooded counterparts. Before Aerith is able to properly aid the King's friends, another swarm of Heartless prevent them from conversing any further. The ensuing chaos brings them to meet Sora, and the three become quick friends. After exchanging their individual conflicts, Sora, Donald, and Goofy decide to embark on a journey together to find Riku, Kairi, and King Mickey. I guess Titus Walk and Selfie didn't make it. Of course, they will also be fighting through different waves of Heartless in each world and sealing the keyhole to prevent worlds from ending. Little do they know, a ragtag group of Disney villains led by Maleficent are utilizing the power of darkness to seek the seven princesses of heart, maidens with an unflinching light, and using them to open a keyhole that leads them to Kingdom Hearts, the heart of all worlds. In this game, anyways. This band of villains includes the likes of Jafar, Captain Hook, Ursula, Rudy Giuliani, and Oogie Boogie, villains of some of the respected worlds Sora and Co. will be visiting. So a little way in, and I already find this setup to be brilliantly intriguing. I admire the lighthearted dynamics between the characters that aren't too out of place in, well, a Disney movie. I do find some of the interactions, namely the more CW-level drama involving Sora and Riku, to fall a little flat at points, but I still care for the genuine friendship between the both of them and Kairi. As someone who knows how crazy and intertwined the plot of the series will get, it's always refreshing to come back to KH1 and digest something a little on the lighter side of things. Moving forward, Sora, Donald, and Goofy travel to select Disney worlds from the likes of Alice in Wonderland, Hercules, Tarzan, Aladdin, Pinocchio, The Little Mermaid, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Peter Pan, and Winnie the Pooh. While Sora, Donald, and Goofy travel to these worlds to interact with Disney All-Stars and take care of the Heartless, the plots within these worlds aren't as crucial to the main story, save for a select few worlds. On one hand, you have a world like Agrippa that takes elements from the movie's plot and creates an abridged retelling. On the other hand, a good chunk of the worlds like in Atlantica and Halloween Town have original stories that offer pretty solid themes that somewhat relate to the ongoing journey. As a heads up, I will be saving my overall thoughts on each world design for the gameplay section. In order to keep appearances though, Sora, Donald, and Goofy can't allow themselves to inform others about the existence of other worlds, which is known as meddling here. Know why we can't meddle? Well... People like Maleficent happen. Around halfway through the game, Sora reunites with Riku after a chance encounter in Traverse Town. Unfortunately, it's revealed that Riku has been taken under Maleficent's wing and is using his own means to find Kairi with the powers of darkness. You know the dynamic between Don Cheadle and LeBron James's kid in Space Jam 2? It's pretty much like that with Maleficent feeding the Dark Embers in Riku's heart. As for Kairi, she is eventually found by Maleficent, albeit in a catatonic state. Sora, Donald, and Goofy eventually find themselves at the doorstep of Hollow Bastion, the penultimate world in the game, and revealed to be the world where Kairi originally came from. Before Sora can settle the score with Riku, he takes the Keyblade from Sora with no trouble. It turns out, Riku was supposed to originally inherit the Keyblade, but the darkness in his heart repelled the weapon onto Sora. Missing the point of what friendship is supposed to be, Donald and Goofy abandon Sora to prioritize their duty to follow the key. Sora reconciles with the beast, and the two storm the castle with the odds stacked against them. Sora encounters Riku once again in the foyer, and after mentioning the strength of his heart, Goofy and Donald come to their senses and return to their friend's side. Sora tells Riku that his friends are his power, persuades the Keyblade back into his arms, and smacks Riku for being the toxic little prick he is. Unfortunately for Riku, that toxicity was enough for Sackman from the islands to peer pressure him into giving himself to the darkness for one last power-up. And wouldn't you know it, Riku comes to be possessed by Ansem, self-proclaimed Seeker of Darkness. After dealing with Maleficent, Ansem reveals to Sora that the final keyhole cannot be opened without all the princesses, revealing Kyra to be a princess of heart, and that her heart had been safeguarded with Sora since the- Oh! Oh no, please don't say that. Sora manages to beat the Ansem-possessed Riku, and in an effort of heroism, frees Kyrie's heart along with the other princesses. Unfortunately, Sora also freed his heart, which means Yes, yeah, see you later, buddy. Upon Kairi coming to, Ansem is held back by the remaining will Riku has and is forced to retreat to the final world. No, not that final world, we aren't there yet. Upon escaping, Kairi, Donald, and Goofy come across a more distinct kind of Heartless acting on its own, which turns out to be Sora. 
He turned himself into a heartless, funniest shit I've ever seen. I guess because Kyrie's a princess of heart, her light is able to bring Sora back from the brink, and the team retreats. I guess this is a good time to talk about Kyrie's role in the story here. I like the mystery of her character at the beginning and how she sort of serves as the catalyst for the main plot to take off. At the end of the day, yes, she does eventually become a girl for Sora to save, but I think the foreshadowing of her heart being within Sora was pretty well executed between the visions and flashbacks we see throughout our time playing as him. I also think it's a nice way to see more of her character shine without hampering the story's flow. While I wish I could understand a little better on what exactly makes her a princess, Alice is also a princess for some reason, so I guess I shouldn't complain much. On the other hand, Ansem is a pretty solid villain, with his introductions being as interesting as the darkness that shrouds him. While I do wish his presence could be explained a little more throughout the game beyond his reports, I think he serves as a great final obstacle in Sora's path, especially after messing with his two best friends, which gives Sora a stronger motive to fight him. As for Maleficent, I think having her be the ultimate Disney villain to fight was a great play, but I do wish she wasn't sidelined following Ansem's reveal. For what it's worth, I think her gathering all these Disney villains under one roof to fight Sora is a great idea that gives the game a really unique identity. As you move forward in the series, you still fight the occasional Disney villain, but there's not really an established Disney House of Villains organization like in this game. As for how this game's story concludes, Kyrie gives Sora her good luck charm before he sets out to stop Ansem and restore the worlds that fell to darkness. Sora, Donald, and Goofy make their way through the end of the world and even fight the ultimate symbol of evil in Disney. Uh oh, uh, excuse me, do you mind? Sora encounters Ansem and delivers a pretty solid speech on the heart, and when the fighting finishes up, Ansem is defeated thanks to Kingdom Hearts itself raining judgment on him with light. Unfortunately, a myriad of Heartless are in wait behind Kingdom Hearts. Thanks to the efforts of a revitalized Riku from the other side, Sora and Co are able to begin closing the door. And of course, King Mickey makes his long-awaited appearance to help seal the door once and for all with his own Keyblade in hand. Sora and Riku say their goodbye, as Riku and the King's fate will be left unknown for some time. As the worlds begin to return to how they once were, Kairi is sent back home but not before she and Sora share one last bittersweet goodbye, ending the game's story. Also, Mickey being shirtless here ends up being a significant plot- Of course, there's the ending that is left open for a sequel, which you may know at this point spawned into a beloved series. So complications and pacing aside, I really enjoyed my time with this story. While I'm saving my thoughts on the voice acting and presentation for its respected section, the new talent in addition to the returning Disney talent really brought this game's story to life for me. It's got issues with pacing here and there, and I find the schoolyard banter between Sora and Riku to be a little juvenile at points, but the game has its own message and story to tell, and I like and respect the themes it has to share with its audience. It's such a strange and miraculous blend that just works when you cross Disney with anime, if you ask me. I apologize to any of my viewers if any of the series terminology began to blend into jargon, but this series first for me is done. <sighs> Just as the story blends from Disney and Square Enix's respected narrative structures, Kingdom Hearts gameplay blends the command menu RPG prompt with an action-based platformer and a fully 3D plane. Seeing as Disney had a great streak with platformers in the 90s, it's kind of fitting in a sense. Like in any other RPGs, you level up with experience as you continue to slay Heartless across the worlds. You have your menu cursor hover over one of the menu options, and you will do that command when you hit the button. Attack is just... Whacking the foes with a giant key, it's pretty self-explanatory. Sora will start out with a three-hit combo, so if you hit that button three times, you get three hits. Simple enough. Magic will take you to an additional sub-menu filled with spells you can cast, complemented with Square's magic tier naming conventions. Your offensive elemental magic with fire, blizzard, and thunder, and you have your more defensive support-based magic in stop, arrow, gravity, and cure. Now, you could be bold and stop in place to select the magic from this window to cast, or you could be resourceful and use the shortcut prompt that the game provides you with. Additionally, magic is structured differently here where instead of a numbered amount of MP, you're given a segmented bar that shrinks with every use of magic, and you refill it either with attacking enemies or using items. You're also provided with items throughout shops and chests that restore your health and magic. Then after a certain point in the game, you're given summons to utilize. Instead of the iconic Final Fantasy summons, we have notable icons from Disney such as Simba, Mushu, Genie, Tinkerbell, Dumbo, and Bambi. Huh. They get the job done. Though, Tinkerbell is a godsend for some of the more challenging boss fights in the game. As for the rest, I save a handful of them for the special Heartless, which we will certainly be getting back to. Either way, I commend the game for providing many options when it comes to combat. 
On the topic of combat though, Donald and Goofy, and another swappable party member depending on the world, will be giving you a helping hand in battle. While it's a wonderful feeling to be fighting alongside these icons, and they're helpful in a few regards, they otherwise won't be contributing as much. You can adjust the settings to have them focus on either support, magic, or what have you, but they're not going to be doing much of the work. That's going to Sora. Goofy will specialize in brute force, and Donald will specialize in being a stickler when it comes to healing you. Is that chirping again? How are you not hearing that? Newsflash, asshole! I've been hearing it the entire goddamn time! Then why would you say something? Because I hate you! To help empower the trio of heroes, you will be given a myriad of abilities to work with and equip that give you certain buffs, use new attacks, makes it easier to nab materials, and for some reason, essentials like dodging and viewing the enemy's health bar. While I argue with these two should have been unlocked at the start, I think everything else is well warranted for unlocking them, with my personal two favorite of the limit abilities for instance being Strike Raid and Sonic Blade. The trio can unlock shared abilities that come more into play while you platform, such as higher jumps and gliding, but most of the other abilities are tailored for combat. But when you're not fighting waves upon waves of Heartless, you're exploring all these different kinds of worlds with their different layouts and challenges to overcome. One by one, these worlds acquaint you with different kinds of intricate challenge, and on the offhand, that PS2 generation jank. So one by one, let's take a gander at the worlds we've got. Destiny Islands will be the first world you will set foot in within the game. You know, before it gets swallowed by the forces of evil and whatnot. It is nonetheless your tutorial world that gets you used to the different kinds of controls and platforming. You have the option to challenge Riku in addition to some Final Fantasy characters that help get you used to the schematics of battling, but progressing the story in the very beginning can be... a slog. Like this here log. While the story introduced presents itself with a lot of intrigue, getting to the meat of the game first requires you to go on two different fetch quests while dealing with some otherwise stiff platforming. Despite its age though, I feel a little bit of guilty pleasure coming back to the platforming, even though Sora's base abilities are on the lackluster end. Traverse Town, on the other hand, will serve as your home base of operations before you embark to your different Disneyland attractions. You have the first district where you can buy and sell equipment, as well as synthesizing. And you also have districts 2 and 3, home to a few Disney cameos and certain waves of Heartless to practice on. Something else I admire about Travers Town is how there's always something interesting going on in terms of finding new secrets and completing new puzzles as you keep coming back after a venture. You eventually gain access to discover Trinity Marks that are scattered throughout a world. As you uncover them, you'll be rewarded with different prizes and items that are worthwhile. Between these, the missing Dalmatians and the town's postcard challenge, I admire how this hub teaches you how the exploration can be rewarding. This is also where you can talk to Sid and access your gummy garage. To travel to other worlds, Sora, Donald, and Goofy will be riding in their rocket, the Gummy Ship. Now, while it's entirely optional to customize your ship or take a blueprint out for a spin, the base combat of the Gummy Ship is pretty sluggish. If you continue with just the base ship, those initially thrilling rides will double in length and start urging you to think, Ah! Are we there yet? However, making your own Gummy Ship is where the magic truly happens. Yeah, that's one fine-looking barbecue pit. WHY DOESN'T MINE LOOK LIKE THAT?! Ah! Once you're given the tools to properly make your own ship, the Gummy Ship goes from being as slow as the first minute and 52 seconds of Spaceballs to a solid enough arcade shooter. If I have one major issue with the garage at all, it's that the user interface for customization is rather tedious. Call it my muscle memory for the other menus, but I have always pressed the wrong thing or two whenever customizing my ship, and sometimes I erase substantial progress. Either way, once your gummy ship is ready for takeoff, you'll be ready to visit your Disney worlds in style, such as... Wonderland. I'll be frank, Alice in Wonderland has to be one of my least favorite pictures from the House of Mouse. Other than a few memorable set pieces, the film itself has never stood out to me that much, and in turn, the messages and themes are lost on me. That being said, I think Wonderland is a great first world when it comes to Kingdom Hearts. While I find the overall progression to be a tad puzzling sometimes, especially when it comes to thinking about first-time players, the world does a good job showing how you can interact with the world around you with both your magic and items. Furthermore, there are a lot of neat callbacks to the motion picture itself, 
Set pieces that reference the film's source material, or other series like in Travers Town, are sort of far and few and in between these days. So KH1 having these small winks and nods to some of Disney's more popular films really goes a long way. Olympus Coliseum If I were a rich man all day long I'd bitty bitty bum if I were a wealthy man. Oi! If you chose the Colosseum as your first world, my condolences. This world is a bit more difficult to try and complete your first visit, as your stats won't be up to snuff into the first tournament's final moment. But knock yourself out, I'm not gonna stop you. The way Olympus progresses is that after a certain number of worlds are cleared, a new tournament will be held for you to take on. After you finish the Hercules Cup, the world's keyhole will be sealed. But after a while, the Hades Cup will open up. It is a 50-tiered gauntlet to fight through with rewards scattered throughout. After you finish that, two optional super bosses will open up. Also, this is where we get to see Cloud rocking a pretty cool design that takes from his pal Vincent. Pretty cool, don't you think? Deep Jungle <laughs> What was that? I was already here! I argue that Deep Jungle is the stress test to whether or not you will continue playing through this game. While there's a lot to enjoy from this world based on Tarzan, I consider this one of my lower ranking worlds in the game. Since it's still fairly early in the game, Sora's abilities are not yet at a point where the platforming feels super comfortable. Even while sliding through the vines, I would mess up with a stiff, albeit poorly timed jump. Furthermore, Plot progression in this world is tied with a lot of backtracking between the treehouse and the camp, before it all ends with a fight between you and a giant chameleon heartless. I do not like fighting this boss, and it's a lot trickier on proud mode. Ah yes, almost forgot. Kingdom Hearts has a difficulty selection. In fact, it's one of the earlier examples I can think about when it comes to setting difficulty in a 3D game such as this. So if you want to experience the game with no hassle and are there for just the Disney and story, play on easy or normal. I would say the only downside with these difficulties is that the challenge starts to fade a little and you find yourself not utilizing every option you have. But that's where Proud Mode comes in. Proud Mode makes everything hurt a whole lot more. Case in point, I died to these red nocturnes here more than I'd like to admit. I think the challenge beyond the damage scaling is a lot of fun, but the added spike like the stealth sneak fight for instance became a lot more brutal. After Deep Jungle however, I argue that the brighter pastures lie ahead, for the most part. Agraba. Leave it to one of my favorite Disney films to bring one of my favorite worlds to explore in the game. If I'm honest, deserts are some of my least favorite environments to play through in video games. But because Agraba takes advantage with both a cityscape and ancient labyrinth, it adds to the right amount of terrain and verticality that feels right at home. In the Cave of Wonders, you also get to witness some of the abilities that party members exclusive to their world can do. For instance, Aladdin can call Abu to activate these switches, and later on, Beast can knock down these impassable walls. Here you even get to have a really fun clash with Jafar, with Gilbert Gottfried as Iago, and make your escape on the magic carpet. All of this truly makes for one of my highest points while playing the game. One more fun fact. Dan Castellaneta, the voice actor for Genie in this game, also provides the voice for Homer Simpson. Monstro. Okay, so no joke, Pinocchio is legit one of my top five favorite Disney films of all time, but Monstro as a world perplexes me. For starters, instead of focusing on where most of the story in the film takes place, like that small town or Pleasure Island, the world's focus, or the world itself, is instead inside the carnivorous belly of the whale. And while I think it's a great concept, I also feel that it limits a lot more ideas you could tell with the world and characters of Pinocchio, especially with Jiminy Cricket serving as your scribe who does get to have some good moments with Pinocchio. However, beyond the mouth of the whale, Monstro's intestines are just a science project under the microscope. I personally feel that while that itself can create more color in an otherwise darker environment, it makes the world lose a bit of identity. If I told you that this was inside Monstro, for instance, would you believe me if I showed you footage from this or this? I will give the Amoeba Rooms credit for some of the platforms having this bony gut look to them that could complement the starting room, but that's all I really have to say. Even though we're done with the whale, we aren't quite out of the water yet. Atlantica. Daddy, no! Daddy, yes! You know what I have to say about this world? 
I actually don't mind it that much. So I think the biggest issues that present itself right away is trying to get used to the swimming controls in addition to being limited from the combat and skills you had been nurturing up until this point. That being said, I found Atlantica as an opportunity of adaptation. I didn't rely on brute force as much because I found myself constantly using magic instead. The world has issues, sure, and it doesn't help that the camera during lock-on can be problematic between its stiff turns and occasional environmental collision, but I don't know, I've never really hated this world. I also like seeing how King Triton is one of a few characters that know about other worlds and the responsibility that comes with Sora's task. The Disney worlds, like I mentioned, are light on overall story, but I really like this detail. That Ursula boss fight, though? Oh, that's trash. Has to be my least favorite fight in the game between the constant barrage of projectile and little to no stagger when she takes damage. I do get a kick out of the occasional quip from her, though. I'm never glad Atlantica is over because it's over. I'm glad it's over because I never have to deal with that boss fight for the rest of the game. Halloween Town. I have a confession to make. I'm not the biggest fan of the Nightmare Before Christmas' aesthetic, despite the animation and story being very well done. That being said, I find it to be terrific in Kingdom Hearts. One of the best touches off the bat has to be Sora, Donald, and Goofy getting world-specific designs to help them blend in with the world they're in. And they look like they could be taken straight from the film. The world design itself is more on the tighter end, though, as many of the world's areas feel a bit cramped in space. Maybe it was a purposeful design choice given the aesthetic's tighter and more jagged look. Oogie's Manor makes up for it, though, with a bit more open space to work with, and I dig the last clash with him following an otherwise okay boss encounter. He didn't have a ghost of a chance. Neverland. Riku, wait! Okay, gonna be real. I think Neverland is my least favorite world in Kingdom Hearts, tied with Deep Jungle. For starters, the world's name has to be the biggest lie, as you don't even set foot on the island. You spend the majority fighting on Captain Hook's ship before being whisked away to merry old England. I mentioned that Halloween Town felt a little narrow, but Hook's ship is pretty cramped below the deck. It isn't until you get outside when you start feeling the thrill of mid-air combat thanks to Tink's magic. And the fight with Captain Hook, while easy to manipulate, is pretty fun. And of course, this is one of few worlds that serves as connective tissue to a turning point in the story. Buckle down, we're in the endgame now. Hollow Bastion. Look, Pim, I know it's our job to help this guy and everything, but I think this guy's a lost cause. He's obviously made up his mind. Why don't we just cut our losses and get out of here? This is my personal favorite world in the game. I know there are a handful who don't like this world as much, but I can't blame them either. Things start off fairly intimidating when the Keyblade is temporarily revoked from Sora, forcing you to rely on Beast and a pitiful amount of offensive magic. But once you get Donald and Goofy back in your good graces, everything just clicks back into place. I also like your fights with Riku from a story perspective. Back on the island, Sora and Riku would often keep score of one another whenever they competed. But now that you two are on opposing sides, it makes things a little more personal to see if Sora can take Riku in a serious fight, or have the underdog finally surpass the reigning champ. The platforming in this world is at its trickiest with an endless amount of heartless coming for you, but if you've made it this far, it should be no problem. Sure, the elevators can be a little slow and some of the enemies are really annoying, but it just feels so... satisfying to overcome it all. Your first fight with Maleficent is pretty solid, where it's you trying to pull her down on a platform to damage but I personally enjoy her tense second fight in her dragon form. It has the stagger issues I mentioned with Ursula, but the difference there has to do with what you had then versus what you have now. And despite the intense attacks from her with little stagger, your kid is more than up to the challenge to put an end to her. Alright, now comes the most intimidating world of them all. The 100 Acre Wood. You know, with Christopher Robin nowhere to be seen in these games, I'm curious if this is taking place during the events of Hello Christopher there. Robin, where he goes off to fight a war and raise a family. Throughout the worlds you visit, you may find a few torn pages from Pooh Bear's book. If you visit Merlin and give these pages back to the book, you'll unlock more of this world's character and activities. Though, the activities themselves are pretty standard minigames. Normally I would suggest you skip these, but the wards are pretty worth it. And it's Winnie the Pooh, damn it! How could you say no to that face?! The minigames themselves are nothing more than harmless distractions, and doing them back-to-back -back can get a little stale, but getting the additional rewards will be really helpful as I mentioned, namely, for the last world. End 
Alright, first, let me apologize for the second JoJo reference. I couldn't help myself, but fans of the series, you can't tell me otherwise that Ansem's Guardian reminds you of a stand. Anyways, moving on! This is the final stop in the game's journey, and the aesthetic perfectly matches the tone it carries. The environments scream a desolate calm before the storm, and you definitely fight the most amount of Heartless here. A wonderful detail I like is how, on your way to the final room, you can see remnants of other Disney properties that were swallowed here by the darkness. Oh, so that's where you've been! I mentioned it before, but you also get a pretty sick fight with Chernabog from Fantasia. Of course, I also really enjoy the final fight with Ansem, but I often usually hold off doing the final fight to take care of some remaining loose ends. Some of those loose ends extend to the Material Synthesis, which you can unlock in Traverse Town as soon as you get the Green Trinity Mark. You talk to the Moogles, and they give you different items and equipment you can craft with many of the materials you come across from fighting enemies. As you continue to play through, you'll begin to realize there are plenty of materials that you don't even have. That's where the special Heartless enter. These guys are a lot more challenging to kill, with a lot of them having different quirks and games on how to secure their drops. While the process is a draining one, as you will need to kill the same type of Heartless repeatedly for the materials, the rewards include the best armor and gear in the game, including the titular Ultima weapon. That being said, I advise beginners stray away from this process if they're playing casually and want to wrap things up. My time grinding materials in Synthesis extended my stay with the game by roughly 8 to 10 hours. Even though the process itself can run thin, it's completely worth it when it comes to the super bosses. Back in the Colosseum after you finish the Hades Cup is Sephiroth, and he is easily one of the trickiest endgame fights to get a hold of. A fun challenge once you learn what abilities to equip, but this game is all about strength and patience for me. Additionally, you can challenge the Ice Titan in a game of attrition, so make sure you know how to move and guard. In Agrabah, the fearless Kurt Zisa will be waiting for you. And while not the hardest extra boss, he is still by no means a pushover. There will be certain instances where you are forced to either rely on your physical attacks or magic, so make sure you prepare accordingly. For me, fights like the aforementioned, in addition to the likes of Riku, provide a nice challenge. Moreover, we have the Phantom who will wait for you atop Big Ben and is a fight that prioritizes magic for the most part. It's your job to cast stop on the clock before it strikes 12, otherwise your party will be picked off one by one. Finally, there's the Enigmatic Man. Which I completely destroyed with the Ultima Weapon. Um... Whoops. Best of luck on that one! I think with these out of the way, I've touched every aspect of the game I wanted to talk about. And while some of it carries the burden of age, I can happily say that I still enjoy a myriad of aspects the game brings to the table. And I'm happy to say I can also extend that praise for the game's production values, for the most part. Okay, music. Let's crack this open. Yoko Shimomura is known as the goddess of video game music for a reason, and her work in the Kingdom Hearts series I consider to be the absolute pinnacle of that. Of course, there's hits from Street Fighter 2 like Guile's theme, her work on the Mario RPGs, and her contribution to Xenoblade Chronicles. I am only scratching the surface of her work. Need I mention her Smash Brothers rearrangements? But when it comes to Kingdom Hearts, she is not only able to capture a world's tone and atmosphere with her music, but also bring many iconic moments of the series to life with her score. Each world comes with an exploration theme and battle theme, which, as I mentioned, she completely knocks out of the park. Her boss battle tracks in particular are what I consider her most notable highlights with hits like Forza del Mal and The Deep End. The final boss track is also truly superb. I could go on about more of her work across the series, especially what we can expect to hear in future entries, but I can only rave about so much at a time. As far as other production values go, I would like to highlight the game's tone in particular. A joint effort between Disney and Square Enix would seem like a bad idea when you'd first hear about it, but as I've alluded to, it works surprisingly well. That being said, a lot of bizarre tonal shifts manage to slip in the cracks when you take a look at what your characters are saying. In the moments where you were not gripped or enamored by the gameplay, you're most likely belly aching over how absurd some of the character interactions can be. Or perhaps you're absolutely captivated. Only in this game can you hear Squall from Final Fantasy VIII be concerned about the 101 Dalmatians separated from their parents. Only in this game can you watch someone push Pooh Bear into the stratosphere. Only in this game you can watch Geppetto be told off by an angsty anime teen that's kidnapped his son. Sorry, old man. I have some unfinished business with this puppet. Ah, yes. The voice performances in the Kingdom Hearts series. One of the biggest testaments as to why many could find themselves enthralled with the story. Or maybe a reason as to why some may cringe in anger from how stupid the dialogue can be. The Heartless obey me now, Sora. 
now I have nothing to fear. You're stupid! Credit where credit is due, though. I think Sora's voice actor in particular, Haley Joel Osment, did a great job voicing the kid in his debut. I can absolutely see why he's stuck to voicing the character after all these years, from his bright optimism to the strength of his heart. If you believe, you can do anything, right? I'll find Kyrie. I know I will. There's so much I want to tell her about flying, the pirates, and everything else that's happened. David Gallagher's Riku I've often found myself back and forth on. His voice is fitting for the curious and antagonistic type, but when Riku is backed into a corner, he comes off as a little too whiny. Still, I think he and Haley have good chemistry working with one another, and I think that shines the brightest in the next entry. How about it, Sora? Let's join forces to save her. We can do it together. What? You'd rather fight me? Over a puppet that has no heart? Hayden Panettiere's Kyrie is perfectly fine between her spunky attitude and kindness towards Sora, but it's clear like the aforementioned she hasn't quite hit her stride. Well, let's go! You can't go. Why not? Because it's way too dangerous. Come on, Sora. We made it this far by sticking together. You can't go alone. And of course, we have the relationship wrecker from Titanic himself, Billy Zane as Ansem, who delivers a deep and charismatic voice to the Seeker of Darkness. While this would be the only time he would voice the character, I think it was a very excellent casting choice, all things considered. All worlds begin in darkness. And all so end. The heart is no different. Darkness sprouts within it. It grows, consumes it. Such is its nature. In the end, every heart returns to the darkness whence it came. You see, darkness is the heart's true essence. As for the other talents, it comes with my favorite part of Kingdom Hearts, being how Disney is able to bring on returning talent from prior Disney works. Donald, Goofy, Minnie, Daisy, and Mickey all have their respected voices, of course, but you also have an extended cast reprising their roles, such as Jim Cummings' as Pooh and Tigger, Pat Carroll's Ursula, Jody Benson's Ariel, James Woods' as Hades, and perhaps the craziest pull of all, Catherine Beaumont, who reprised both Alice and Wendy. Of course, for the names who are substantially big and maybe not as affordable, certain talent was brought on board to fill in their respected roles, with the emulation of each performance variant, of course. I mentioned Genie and Homer sharing a voice with distinct differences, but Robert Jason Costanzo in particular does a fantastic job as Phil, and I honestly couldn't tell at first that it wasn't Danny DeVito. But with all this talent, it does come down to how it's reflected in the presentation. Graphically speaking, this is easily one of the easiest PS2 games on the eyes especially with the 2013 HD remaster making it really pop. The cutscenes themselves alternate between certain models where the characters will have more static face movements, but then switch to more animated counterparts in a more story-important cutscene. When the voices come into play themselves in the cutscenes, the quality varies in certain scenarios. Where certain roles are cast well, the voice direction and delivery might not be up to par with certain writing inconsistencies at certain moments. It doesn't help that despite having a beautiful score, a majority of cutscenes just straight up don't have music to them, leaving them to feel awkward and flat with all the dramatic nonsense that could be playing out on screen. That being said, it does make for some funny edits to insert music of your own. <sighs> Do you need some help? Riku! Is that? Yes, a Keyblade. But unlike yours, this Keyblade holds the power to unlock people's hearts. Allow me to demonstrate. Behold! To summarize, when the production values hit, they hit really hard. But when they fumble, you can really feel it in the atmosphere. Despite my qualms about its inconsistent production values and a few dated gameplay elements, Kingdom Hearts is a game that I never grow tired of playing. It certainly has issues getting started, but once in that flow, it makes for a very memorable journey to kick off one of the craziest series in gaming. The gameplay has an oddly satisfying blend of action platformers and RPGs alike, while really knowing how to cater to two vastly different audiences. The music is jaw-droppingly beautiful, and while the story may rely on certain tropes a little too much, the message it tells is one that can really resonate with the player, and I really have to appreciate the beat it marches to on its own. 
For those who are looking for a new story to experience with certain themes not uncommon in a work from Walt Disney, give Kingdom Hearts a try. It's not for everyone, but the series being where it is now should show just how much it has garnered the hearts of its audience. If you liked the thoughts I had to share, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share this video with others. Thank you all for watching. I've been the Squire, and be kind to one another. To commemorate the series' 25th anniversary, I'm beginning a tradition featuring videos related to One Piece. This month, I'll be giving retrospective on the pros and cons to one of my favorite characters, recap and speculation pertaining to the story this past year, and giving impressions to a game I played recently that genuinely surprised me. Stay tuned as I kick off the month of One Piece. I'm gonna be King of the Pirates!